Hello, hello. Great. All right. Yeah. Sit here and I'll uh, sit at the end. Nina, can you hear us? We don't hear her. We don't uh, hear the, the speaker on the screen. Nina, could you maybe turn on your camera? Hey, there you are. All right, can you speak a bit so we can make sure that it's working? And your mic, mi no, we don't hear you. Your microphone is not turned off, eh? No. Can you try again? Uh, my microphone is turned on. So hey, no. yeah, perfect. We're hearing you, the connection is a bit lagging, but we're seeing you well, and we're hearing you, so that is great. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, I think we're slowing on the start, so if the, the people chatting in the center of the room can be able to kind of sit down, I welcome you very much so to join in. Everybody, Israelis, or are they Israelis? Okay. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello. Are you, are you joining in? Oh, wonderful. Can you sit down? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh. Great, great, great. Good. I think we're slowly going to start. We've got a full house. And most good, 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 good. All right. So. Good. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, all good? But I'm going to use it. Yeah? Welcome, everybody, to uh, the session at the COP27, uh, Securing Sustainable Energy for All, a global perspective. Welcome. Um, I'm going to do something. Because no, no, normally when you sit in a, in a hole like this, like at COP27, you, uh, slowly people start to sleep in their red chair. So I'm not going to make that happen this time. So what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of walk into the room and i uh, going to ask some people who are th how they're doing, what their name is, for who they're working, and what do you expect of the session? Hi, I'm Tammy from Israel, from Adam Teva Bedin, uh, Israeli environmental advocacy NGO. And I expect uh, interesting discourse on how you can actually do uh, climate justice and not just talk about it. Great, great. Is there something you, that's something, something in the COP conference that really hit hard, hit home this time for you? It absolutely has to be the difference in the urgency between the global south and the global north and the need to push things forward in that, that aspect. Great. Thank you, thank you. Um, great. Ah, a volunteer. That's what I love. Hello, what's your name? Hello, I'm Melanie from Bonn. I'm deputy mayor and I'm here because I would like to see and hear my colleague from Cologne, Andreas Wolter. Wonderful. Wonderful. And um, as some, what, what struck you the most this, this, in this, this year's conference on so far? Uh, 
uh, sorry, I can't understand. What? So what, what, what did you find most striking? You've been, how long have you been here now? Uh, just the second day. Oh, just the second day. Yeah, and um, I love the conference because of the very good energy. I think it's, um, it gives us peace um, and it calms down. It's, it makes hope, hope okay. for everybody. Great, I like that, I like that. All right, uh, I won't disturb you because that's, that's really unfair. I see somebody's eating there. Maybe, sir, over here. Hello, what's your name? Where do you work for? What do you expect? Hi there, my name's Alex Murray. I work for the uh, Climate Action Against Disinformation um, and just interested to hear more about kind of collaborating. Uh, we work across a number of different NGOs uh, and, and a range of groups around the world, so collaboration is always the key of what we're trying to find out about. And can you, can you, what is that disinformation? Like, can you give a, an example that is, for example, during this 27, is there something that we need to know about? I mean, if you want to hear more, please do come and talk with me. Uh, but we have 30 analysts currently running uh, analysis of uh, disinformation threats and um, themes, and there's a whole range. Our bulletin today was about using information about Greta Thunberg and how that's been weaponized. Um, but there's been everything right through to uh, conspiracy theories and trying to undermine uh, loss and damage financing. So, whole range. Thank you. And where can we look this up? Uh, it's Climate Action Against Disinformation, so C-A-A-D dot info. Okay. Great, great. All right. Um, that's it for all. All right, let's start with the panelists. Welcome again for people entering. And welcome Nina on the screen. Great for having you. Hello, hello. So, um, we have a, a, a bunch of things to talk about. Um, I, before I kind of kick in, I uh, will introduce myself. I'm Max Beinefeld. I'm policy coordinator at Climate Alliance, a uh, city network uh, of over 2,000 uh, cities that are member, uh, mainly based in, in the European Union. And I have the honor to moderate this session with uh, this incredible panel. And uh, I would love to let, uh, give you a brief introduction who we have on the panel. Sitting here to my closest left, we have Andreas Walter, is the mayor of the city of Cologne, and in addition to this honorary work as council member, mayor and first deputy to Lord Mayor Henrit Reker. He's chairman of the Climate Alliance and chairman of the Franco-German Committee in the Council of European Municipality and Regions. So welcome, Andreas. Then we have Lee Goldenberg, uh, uh, she's a policy press professional at Chatil, specializing in the legal and regulatory aspects of the energy and infrastructure economy, climate change, air pollution, and economic environmental policy. A certified lawyer and litigator, leading some of the most important environmental lawsuits of the last decade in Israel. Welcome also to you, Lee. And then to the farthest right, we have Minister Heyman. Welcome. A bit jet lag still, only three days in. And uh, all the way from uh, British Columbia. Um, he is Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy for the province of British Columbia. Heyman has led the provincial response to climate change through the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030, one of the strongest climate and clean economy plans in North America as well as BC's climate preparedness and adaptation strategy. So welcome as well to you, uh, Minister. Um, and then finally, uh, on the screen, we have with us uh, Nini Ratia-Lena. She's 36 years old, co-president of the Greens in the European Committee of the Regions. She is celebrating her 10th anniversary as the member of the City Council of Turkey and is currently also a board member of Turco Energy, the leading energy company in Southwest Finland. Welcome to you. So. Thank you. Starting off, I think, um, I think one of the most pressing topics uh, in this uh, climate conference has been, as well as uh, um, the, the lady in the audience had noted, is this, of course, this collaboration of the global north and south. And 
to, to start off with this, I was wondering if, uh, Minister Heyman, if you could kind of see how, what your visions are on this, uh, how does that resonate with you? This, this is, is there a collaboration more needed between the global north and south? And even from a regional perspective, how do you look on that? Well, in many ways, it's, um, as you correctly point out, it's a, it's a national question, but it's a national question uh, that concerns everyone. And I think from a sub-national government perspective, like a province in Canada, um, the first thing I want to focus on is that if we, if we can't, at a, even at a local level, like a city, a, a region, or a state, or a province, uh, make significant progress on addressing climate change. We can't as nations. And if, if we can't as nations, we can't globally. And if we can't as the North, it is going to be the South that has not been primarily the source of the crisis we face that will bear the significant brunt of it. We all will, but we know that, uh, uh, that many nations in the South will already are feeling the impacts uh, significantly. So. I think a couple of things. We have to be very ambitious in our uh, goals for emission reduction. We have to collaborate across borders to find solutions. And um, in the north, we have to seriously, as people have called for at this COP, uh, provide support for um, southern nations and for un uh, less developed nations to prepare for the impacts, as well as to uh, transition to clean energy in ways that uh, don't bankrupt their countries or their people. Yeah. All right, so like that there is a big responsibility. You say like we, we need to carry the responsibility as the North for making sure that we uh, diminish our climate, uh, uh, the, 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 the climate output we're making and in this way we contribute. But do we, do you feel that there is a, I don't know, is there for example also uh, the, collaborate, the direct correlation of the British Columbia with a region in the south, for example? Well, we are part of, British Columbia is part of some alliances that have been uh, formed over many COPs, whether it's the, uh, uh, the Ocean Acidification Alliance, uh, the OA Alliance, or whether it is uh, uh, agreements uh, across nations, including nations in the south, to take action to um, to protect against the impacts of climate change, whether it is uh, uh, ocean impacts or whether it is uh, uh, impacts to help protect ag against drought or advance agricultural technologies. And it's through those kinds of, there, there's two reasons for the agreement. Uh, it, it spurs us mutually to take action. It offers, I think, some reassurance to all the nations that are party to the agreements that we're not acting alone while other people do uh, either nothing or not enough. But it also provides a vehicle to, to share knowledge, uh, uh, share gains, share technologies, share successes, uh, and be more efficient. Okay, thank you, thank you. I was one, uh, you, Andreas, you were you mentioned also that this is something that, that plays a role for you as, as major of, of, of uh, deputy major of Köln. How do you see that? So, so uh, first of all, um, so energy um, is one. Is, uh, yeah, municipal service of general interest interest in, Ger in in Germany because we have a federal system. Point one. But what uh, what I want, would like to act at is uh, that we have uh, also with an indigenous. Uh, with indigenous pe people in the, in the Amazon. That's also one of the, our uh, important points of our association, Climate Alliance. We have a strategic partnership because we, we see what, what happens there down in the Amazon due to our uh, attitude, how to, to our, we, we, we developed our economical life that, that caused big problems at, at the Amazon and this uh, also their countries there uh, um, um, will be cut down the forests where, where they live and we want to support them to keep their forests, to keep their land as well as to keep the, the, the Amazon because it's very, very important that we, um, what we uh, 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 that the Amazon will not be cut down in the next years. Yeah. 
So yeah, the, the, so there is a there is a responsibility for us, and in Climate Alliance, of course, there is a direct correlation between helping indigenous people and and making sure that cities in in general need to be net zero in in, in 2050. Um, just just going to the to the to the, the that's direct on the local level between indigenous people at a local level and cities. I think that's very very important. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I was also wondering, uh, Nina, you, 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 uh, you as re representative of, of the very, very far north, um, how, how do you see that? How do you see that collaboration uh, moving forward? Well, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to be here from the very far north, as you well put, uh, from Finland, more precisely. Yes, indeed, uh, because... Um, we have very many uh, and very uh, fruitful cooperations between cities and regions in Committee of the Regions of Europe and Climate Alliance and so many other uh, networks that are really contributing to the collaboration on climate policy agenda. But when it comes to city to city and region to region level, we of course have uh, lots of cooperation also uh, to our neighbors. And this is something that is very important. Uh, maybe I'm speaking on behalf of European Committee of the Regions now, we have lots of cooperation with the border areas. And in that, in that kind of uh, atmosphere, I think peer-to-peer -peer learning at both ways is quite important and something that uh, give gains to, to all, all parties. But we have to have more cooperation and I'm really happy to see that during climate conference, history of climate conferences, cities and regions have really gained lots of more role and taken more role in this context. And we have global networks when it comes to decision makers of local, local decision levels and, and regional decision makers. This is quite important because, of course, we know that uh, most of the people live in cities and we emit the most of our climate gases in cities, so cities are actually the very good places to both mitigate and and also the plan resilience and adaptation uh, policies. So I think all in all, uh, history, history of climate conferences and cities visibility in COPs have um, rapidly evolved during the last 10 years and I'm really looking forward to next next some years because uh, where well, this COP particularly is special to me uh, when it comes to loss and damage and hearing the voices from vulnerable areas, the most vulnerable areas for climate crisis. So I think that in this context, we must work together more to really mitigate the uh, negative effects that climate change has. And when it comes to solidarity, I think that cities like mine, the city of Turku, uh, our first priority is to mitigate our emissions as soon as possible, and that's the first goal for us, because historically we are the great emitters in the North. Yeah, so I, I think that's, it's, it's like, that's what both you are mentioning, uh, Nina and also Ms. Minister Heyman, you were saying, hey, we need, to, our first responsibility is mit to mitigate this, but like, looking at you, Ali, do you think at one point, do we need to, like, uh, I, I consider maybe Israel is, is a very central leg located, but maybe we consider them to be more of the global north uh, in terms of economic development and, and, uh, and also the, uh, yeah, in, in economic development terms. Do you think that Israel needs to start paying for solar, uh, solar panel projects in Africa? Or, or in this case, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the Israeli government or cities, uh, Tel Aviv, for example? Um, before I answer that not so simple question, <laughs> I want to just touch on a couple of things that were said here because coming to the, this COP and hearing the discussion about loss and damages for me is quite a mirror of what happens on more of the local level and I think that's what we've kind of come to talk about here, which is just to throw it in already, but the discussion of just transition, right? And I think a lot of what we're talking about on the higher level, which is often much more difficult to reach agreements on, can be more easily reached on the lower level, right? We'll call it the municipal level or the civil society level or whatever you want to call it, right? As soon as we're looking out for those acknowledgements of just transitions and how to move forward locally, I think those will translate globally. And that's uh, what I wanted to say about that. Whether Israel needs to pay for African um, and generally Israel's response to climate change. Look, Israel likes to consider itself part of the developed world. Whoever's been to the uh, our pavilion here can see that we're very proud to actually dis to show all of our very impressive innovation regarding the field of climate change. But internally and financially, we've been fairly unsuccessful in promoting climate at all. 
Most of our international obligations we haven't reached specifically in energy, but almost anything. And those obligations are fairly, in my personal opinion, mediocre in any case. So whereas I think there is some justification in having Israel pay for other places, and we don't have to go as far as Africa, right? We can go to our neighbors, which would yeah. contribute to Israel as well. Dis there's small discussions of having shared energy in the region, but they're very slow and very small and could contribute to a change in climate change much faster, while at the same time touching on those loss and damage issues. Yeah. And why do you think is that? Why do you think... Uh, you were mentioning that Israel is not contributing in the way that it, it should be, according to you. Why do you think that is the case? I mean, if anyone follows the news, you may have noticed we've had some political instability over the past five or six years. So that's a fairly large contributor, in my opinion, to the lack of advancement. Because I think in order to contribute to climate change and to feel you're part of the global fight against climate change, you need vision. And you can have vision in six months, right? You might come in with a vision, but making significant changes in six months is very, very difficult. A stable government would be more successful, but a stable government that puts climate as its priorities. And Israel's economic approach and also general approach to environmental issues almost always in all governments has been mediocre. There's a, a change in the right direction, but it's a change in the right direction that kind of moves one step forward and two steps back. Um, I'd like to say I'm hopeful for the next government, but I'm unfortunately, if, it, if it's going to form the way it's looking like it's forming, it's not looking like the greatest partner for the environment. And that's why we'll have to, as civil society and, and local governments, again, take much more of those things into our, into our work and move it forward on the local level, which can also be translated into the international level. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the only thing I experienced how you had with Israel and, 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 and also kind of this uh, nature protection is was, it was while climbing in the country. And they are extremely good in protecting climate, uh, uh, climbing rocks in Israel. So it's a very, there's a very limited amount of places where you can climb. So if they get that energy and gear towards like sustainable energy, I think you'll be, you'll you'll be, be out of this in, in no time. But um, uh, I want to kind of, uh, um, again, if, by the way, if speakers want to respond to each other, please uh, uh, give me a sign here on the panel. Or Nina, please, please also mention it if you, if you would like to respond. Um, I want to kind of go to uh, kind of the next uh, subject of, of this panel. And, and that are mainly, we are talking about the securing a sustainable um, uh, energy for the future. Uh, especially looking at local and regional uh, challenges. Um, Minister Heyman, what is for you uh, the, currently the, the biggest challenge uh, to, 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 to go to that, yeah, securing sustainable energy future? You, in British Columbia, 95%, I think, I heard is, is already sustainable energy. So what, what challenges do still lay ahead? Well, that's partly correct. 90% uh, of our electricity is renewable, but only about two-thirds of our energy use is uh, electricity. So there is a big gap there, and there, so one of the challenges we face is electrifying uh, our industries, as well as electrifying communities and buildings and transportation and shifting transportation modes. Uh, so that, that is really at the heart of our, our plan, which we called Clean BC, to meet our 20, 30, 40, and 50 targets. Um, so one of the challenges is building enough electricity infrastructure for the future. And by the future, I don't necessarily mean 2040, I, I mean 2030, uh, to meet the requirements of industrial electrification. Another big challenge for us is um, it's not a bad challenge to have in a way when you have 98% renewable electricity, but because we have that, um, we, uh, if we're meeting emission reduction targets expressed as a percentage, we have to find it in much harder to find places. And uh, much of British Columbia's economy is still natural resource based, which can be uh, quite carbon intensive, so we we need to work with industry to reduce their emissions, both from um, land disturbance and and other aspects of their operations, while at the same time working with them to electrify, and that means co-investing with them. Some of our programs uh, uh, to support industry and recycle our carbon tax, 
uh, that they pay is to co-invest with them to, for emission reduction actions. Um, at the same time, because we've had a carbon price uh, since 2008 and it continues to rise now, uh, we were the first in Canada to have it and now we're rising in line with the, uh, the federal government's carbon tax, which is a very good thing, but we, we want to ensure that we don't put British Columbia resource industries, which are already among the least carbon intensive for similar industries uh, across the planet, out of business uh, because other jurisdictions don't put a price on carbon, so we'd be substituting higher intensity products for lower intensity products. So uh, it's a delicate balance to continue to drive the emission reductions in industry while supporting them uh, to do that and finding the funds uh, to do so. Uh, I'll, I'll just pause there and I'm yeah. sure I'll have opportunity no, to say more about it. No, I think it's interesting what you're saying, especially uh, that the, you, you, you're doing great things in British Columbia. You me, you're mentioning that, um, that your industries are one of the least carbon in intensive in the world, but I, 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 just, I, I, I was curious and I, I looked something up and I was wondering if you can tell uh, something about it. In, in Europe, at the moment, we have a goal of reducing our energy. So there it is, we, we increased the reduction goal in the European Union to, to 13%, the European Commission did. So there's actually a goal to reduce the energy consumption of, of, of the continent. And I was wondering, is that is also a challenge for British Columbia? Because I looked up that the energy intensity of a person living in British Columbia is one of the highest, is, is maybe the, the highest in the world. It's three times the energy intensity per person of an average European country. Is that something you are working on to reduce? Well, I think that's true of um, Canada as a whole. Oh, maybe, uh, yeah. And there's some reasons for that. We're, we're a very large land mass with a relatively small population that's very concentrated along the southern border close to the United States. So in cities, it is easier to reduce energy intensity and consumption, but in we are responsible to a, a lot of uh, citizens that are uh, spread across uh, a land mass that's really large, living in small communities, living in communities with um, very harsh winters, although perhaps not as harsh as Finland, and um, um, who have to travel great distances. So when we talk about, for instance, uh, moving toward a higher take-up of zero emission vehicles, which we've been pretty successful at, I think we lead North America on a percent per capita, we're at about 19 percent of new vehicle sales now, people in the North think that that can't apply to them, or it <clears throat> Excuse me, it doesn't yet because uh, they have to travel long distances, the charging infrastructure isn't there, a charge won't last as long, et cetera, et cetera. Also, in order to reduce the energy intensity of home heating, you need, one, you need to move people away from fossil fuels to um, electric heat pumps, and you, you need a massive program of energy efficiency retrofits, which can be more expensive and harder to do in um, sparsely populated areas, even for things as simple as energy assessors simply live in those communities, so yeah. people have to find energy assessors. So there's, uh, there's a range of things, but, but let me just add one more thought. So we talk about in British Columbia moving towards zero emission transportation, both personal vehicles and uh, and um, medium and heavy duty uh, transportation of goods, commercial transportation. But another very significant part of our climate plan is to have a very significant mode shift of transportation to, um, to active transportation, cycling, rolling, walking, building the infrastructure that makes it easier for people to do that, and investing massively in public transportation. Okay. Okay, thank you. So that, you're doing a lot, um, but I didn't hear like an actual energy efficiency target. I think, but uh, uh, just, just, what, if, if there's if there's one one sentence, and then I'll go to to, to Nina, to the, the other 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 overachiever when it comes to consuming energy. 
<laughs> we have a legislated emission reduction target, but not an energy intensity target. But in order to reach it, we will be working on mechanisms uh, like that. Okay, thank and you. The active transportation was one example. Of okay, that. thank you. Uh, Nina, you already mentioned in a talk of the, the other uh, panelists. Um, what, what are your big, biggest challenges? Like, are you, you, you obviously have a hard time heating your homes, uh, I can imagine. Uh, so so what, what are you looking for these days? What is your biggest challenge at the moment? Thank you. I, I think we have some similarities to what the previous speaker mentioned. We use lots of energy for heating and we have lots of, we have a small population and, and large country, maybe, maybe not the same extent as Canada, but still people move a lot and heating is something that uh, uh, is very energy intensive. In Finland altogether, me myself, I am I'm living in a you know, 200 years old wooden house and, and my own energy bill is skyrocketing at the moment. So I really feel the pain when it comes to energy, tr energy transition and, and, and making energy affordable. But um, you asked about the difficulties. Um, um, my city of Turku, we have been able to transform our uh, electricity produ production to 90% renewable and 70% of the of the heating into renewable and, and heating is of course the more more difficult part to make uh, absolutely carbon neutral but this is that we what we try to do our ca carbon neutrality target is in 2029 and uh, if we work very well and I think we might be able to reach it even for but that. But and how are you doing that? How are you, how are you making sure that you heat a house in, in Finland that where it's so cold with renewable energy? How, how do you do that? Well, actually something that uh, is helping us a little is because uh, in Finland we have lots of district heating. Uh, we, that's the main, main uh, system for us in, in heating houses and this enables us to use lots of waste for example, waste for water, heat, and some and 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 uh, have usage of the heat that otherwise would be wasted. So because of this district heating system, we can we can use uh, we can we can use the energy that we pr produce elsewhere. For example, in waste management sector, it is an effort and and it is times at, at at least a lot. But you know this is something that we have started to do long ago. Uh, like, like tens of years ago, so the, um, the situation now isn't isn't that new. I'm talking about crime, climate crisis, but of course also about fossil fossil energy crisis that we are facing because of the war that uh, Russia launched, and because we have been also already making a strategy to become uh, both energy ind independent and also very uh, renewable. A uh, few decades ago, we are quite far already in this. Uh, in this effort, so that's 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 the reason that I think that we are in a good path already. And this autumn, people have been actually able to save energy quite a lot. Already in October, eight percent of energy consumption was uh, saved uh, in regard to last year, because people are quite aware. Maybe it's also because of the price of energy, but still, like mm, maybe twenty years ago people were most interested when they made their own electricity and heating contracts. They were most interested about uh, the price of energy. But nowadays, actually, people are quite interested in the energy source. And from our energy consumption of, of Turku Energia, which I'm a board member in, already 38 percent of yeah. all the production is marked for the for the consumers that want to buy green okay. energy. I think that's a good signal. And you were mentioning also that your own energy bills keep on rising. Like I think, uh, like you said, uh, like a crazy amount. It was what was your energy bill? Oh, sorry for me asking. You don't have to tell, but it was it, it, no. it was shocking. Let's be open. Well, it's now 150 euros, but. In winter time, it will be closer to thousand euros, and yeah. it's a worrying thing for lots of people. And this is something that people struggle a lot in in coming winter. So we really have to uh, have more energy production in renewable energy, absolutely. But this yeah. is something that we have already decided to do a few decades ago. Okay, great. Um, does some of the panelists want to uh, contribute? I think Lee, you also. Uh, we, we were talking about Israel being kind of, you know, their, their contributions, their national contributions have been too little, according to you. But there's also 
Is there also something you were proud of, uh, what Israel has been doing? Yes, I sound uh, very pessimistic. No, first of all, <laughs> um, listen, I want to tell you about something that we've done in civil society over the past year, which is something that I'm very proud of. It's a collaboration between Shatil and uh, Heshel, who my colleague is sitting in the audience as well, and an organization called Adva. And it's a collaboration um, whose purpose is what I call to knock down the walls between civil society organizations and environmental organizations. Because in Israel, environmental organizations are not yet labeled uh, left or liberal. They're very apolitical. They've been a we've been mostly, we'll call it, separated on many, many issues. Environmental organizations are apolitical. Yeah, are apolitical. Okay. And okay. most other civil society organizations are obviously not apolitical, yes, when it's, especially when it comes to Israel, but at all. And um, this process that we decided to go through was a process to show civil society organizations or to introduce civil society organizations to the climate crisis. It sounds a bit naive, but it's not introduced. It's just saying that the climate crisis affects all of us. It has, we all have an ability to affect in a positive way the climate crisis, and we all need to be prepared for the climate crisis. So on the one hand, um, I'm proud because it's a big move, right? A, a big move to have civil society organizations that are on a daily basis trying to fight for people's rights, you know, people who are living in poverty, people who are old women, different rights, who have decided to take on uh, another issue to deal with. Right? And we're talking about 30 organizations that decided to join this, um, seven working groups and 16 initiatives that are now being promoted in various aspects of Israeli policy in Israel, uh, on both the local and the governmental level. Um, and that's something that's, in my opinion, something to be very proud of. Organizations that are already very busy understanding that the climate crisis affects th them and their populations and taking on added work to move forward and make a change for the entire world. That's great. I can imagine, like, if you, uh, Andreas, when I look at you, if you hear, like, environmental organizations, Ali, I will, I will get, uh, get to you in a bit. Like, if you, if you hear about an environmental organization that is apolitical, to talk in the German context, that's, Ali, you, you, that's probably something you'll, you'll be shocked by, right? Because, like, we, we have, I think, most environmental organizations in, in Germany they, they, they tend to, to, to block uh, brown coal plants on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Or, or, or do, did you want to comment on something else? Yeah, perhaps, first of all, our biggest challenge in Germany is act actually the war of Russia and Ukraine. So gas is limited in Germany this winter. And that causes a lot of problems, energy poverty. So the prices of gas are rising very, very much. Um, so we have to, um, to think about support of people with low income. So that, that's one of the big challenges. Uh, the other thing, what you're talking about, yes, Cologne, we have a, Germany has a federal, uh, we are a federal republic. So the, the local level is responsible nearly for everything. And um, so we have our energy companies, we have our own um, uh, energy power plants in our city. And Cologne, um, yeah, it's like the whole region, it's based on coal. It's, it's a, it's a, there, there was a, the headquarter of, uh, of, the, of the coal company was in Cologne. And all plants 40 years ago were, uh, were fired with, with uh, um, they worked with brown coal, with, with lignite coal. And that's the worst coal uh, for, for uh, greenhouse gas emissions we, we, we know. And, so we started this transformation 40 years ago. Now we change from, from brown coal to gas. That's one of our problems we have actually in our city. That's not, not so many Russian, not so much Russian gas, more from Netherlands and from, uh, from Norway, but also from Russia too. And uh, that's our actual problem. And what we, you talked about the, the NGOs and um, yeah, we, we had a, a fight against this, um, brown coal mines outside of Cologne in the last years and that was um, and uh, two years ago there was an initiative um, from it's called Klimawende Köln so climate change Cologne they collect uh, um, for a petition 30,000 signatures and that means if the city council doesn't adopt this petition to get out of greenhouse gas emission uh, in electricity and heating there will be um, a citizen's decision. 
directly with this question. And so both sides negotiated. So the NGOs with the city, with, uh, with our uh, energy company, and at least we said we, we would like to go out in 2035. And we, uh, they, there was a mediation process in the last two years with this result at least. And uh, now we are also, we have milestones. And it's, I think that that was a very good result that we, with our citizens, we did developed how to get out from, from this uh, greenhouse gas emissions in, in the next uh, 13 years. And um, by example, Cologne, 1.1 million inhabitants, um, we, we have to put every year on 50,000 rooftops uh, photovoltaic systems. So that's, and you can see, that's a real big challenge. So this year we started with around 3,500 in six months. The program starts in summer. And that, that you can see how, how big this challenge would be. Uh, the second point, we support our citizens with money. So they get money from the state in order to, to, to invest in uh, environmental friendly heating systems or energy systems. And we put something on top, so yeah. that the people can, for example, yeah. 30,000 euros maximum for changing uh, the heating system uh, per, yeah. per household. Uh, I think this is quite a lot of money, yeah. but we have to, yeah, to invest more. So, so we, we yeah. learned that, that, that it's good, but if to reach this, these goals, we have to, to do more yeah. than this. Thank you, uh, Andreas. And I think this is very interesting, right? Like we have a very uh, political climate group who asked for a petition and they made, and Andreas I know is part of the Greens, they made, they, they made actually the, the, the municipality of, 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 of Cologne, if I correct, change their climate target from 20, 20 to, to be climate neutral from 2045 to 2035. I'm, I'm looking at you, Lee, because you're saying like you're proud that you're politicizing the environmental groups. But do you want a politicized environmental groups with a government that is, you know, not, not green, uh, let's just say, uh, like, like Andreas, you know? Um, it's will they listen? It's a, uh, will they listen? I don't know if the specific government will listen in any case. I'm sorry, I'm very uh, pessimistic at this point. Listen, I, I think to get um, results in this fight that we need to all work together. So it's obviously a, a challenging issue and it's something that we're still working on with us. We wanted to do kind of the same process with environmental organizations to have them involve themselves more in social issues and just transition issues. There are some that are already doing it but few and far between and we think that the more voices we have demanding a just transition and climate change period, the stronger we'll be, right? So while there's obvious complications in some sort of politicization, Whoever wants to believe these organizations are already political or doesn't want to work with them isn't gonna, it's not going to change their mind, in my personal opinion. Mm. I think you have to be uh, delicate and elegant when you're planning policy moves, whatever it is, and whether it's a petition or it's speaking to politicians, you need to know who and when to do it. But I think we have the tools the more we are, right? And that's something that I've seen here um, coming back and being repeated often and often, that we need communities. We need civil society, we need lawyers, we need activists, we need politicians. We need to all be able to move forward together or work together to move it forward. And yeah, there's politics and climate, right? It's unfortunate or not unfortunate. It is what it is. And I think we still need to make sure that it happens. Yeah. And, and do for my, my for also that, like, obviously there's a, an increasing part of the, the population in Israel's religious or, or, or orthodox religions. I thought that there were actually yesterday or today there were a protest um, of uh, African activists, religious activists were saying like, we need, uh, we need to change, uh, we need to, uh, to go to net zero from a, from a religious perspective. Do you see that there are also uh, orthodox Jewish communities uh, fighting the, the, the climate fight? I mean, yes. I've worked with uh, organizations in the past that are orthodox religious communities that are specifically dealing with environmental and climate issues. They were dealing specifically with generators in a small religious city called Bet Shemesh. I'm not sure it's small anymore, but it's a city. And there were specific generators being used on Saturday, which is the Jewish holy day, because they didn't want to be connected to the grid because they knew the grid was being... Uh, used on Saturday and that's against their beliefs. So what they had is they had generators put in instead causing a lot of pollution in their neighborhoods and then 
And we tried to work with them together to have them install solar panels specifically instead of generators, right? Um, which is something that we believe, period, that you should use or help, um, sorry, less powerful populations use the advantages of the climate change in order to make their lives better. However, you'll hear other voices, specifically, for example, with um, non-reusable or plastic uh, dishes. So there was a law passed this year which actually, uh, to limit the amount of plastic that was able to be used, and the biggest anti of this law are the religious community, and that's one of the first decisions that may or may not be reversed with this And why government. were they against it? Because um, for dietary religious reasons, they use more of these dishes, and it raises the prices of them quite significantly, so they feel it was a specific attack on them and their religious beliefs, um, which obviously was not the intent of this move. The intent was to make sure people use less plastic. But because they haven't been proposed a specific solution to balance out the need for this, they're very against it. They're very against the increasing cost of living. You asked Nina beforehand, but Israel is already very, very expensive to begin with. And with the global crisis at the moment, our cost of living is getting higher and higher. And this is a particularly um, poor socioeconomic population, most of them. So for them, they saw it as a, an additional burden to them, an additional burden to attack some plastic bags. And therefore, they're very opposed to it. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a question of uh, discussion, dialogue, education. But while there are some, there are others on the other side as well. Nice. OK, very interesting. Thank you, uh, Lee. Um, Minister Heyman, I saw you reaching for the, for the microphone. Would you, would you want it to respond? Or, uh, or, 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 or can we? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely so. <laughs> I, 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 I was mostly just adjusting it, but I was... Uh, okay, but now, was, you're, now you have the floor. Now, now I can always yours. respond. I was thinking <laughs> that um, my experience is um, a bit different, and for obvious reasons, but uh, when I have met with members of religious um, communities on the issue of climate, it has almost entirely been because I am meeting with committees within a synagogue or a church who are... Uh, advocating for stronger action on climate. And the challenge is, uh, I often find that the approach, understandably, is very idealistic and not very concerned with the, the pragmatics of, uh, of bringing the rest of the population al along as opposed to, here is the theoretically perfect solution, why haven't you implemented it already? Yeah, all right. Thanks for, uh, for, for that. Um, I think we, we, we talked about a lot about like kind of inclusion. Um, we talked about ch uh, challenges. We talked about uh, some, some uh, best practices. I was wondering, I, I, one of the questions, the guiding questions that I uh, put forward was uh, something, and, and all, none of you of all, uh, were, were, was willing to answer, but maybe I'm putting now you on the spot anyways. Is, is there something you're not very proud of? And... But, and, 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 and in, in this sustainable energy transition. Maybe, maybe Nina, could you, would you, would you want to start off? You're the, you're the farthest away, so that makes it easy for me. Thank you. Yeah, well, of course, I'm, there's so many things I am not proud of. We are not hitting the <coughs> 1.5 target at the moment. With the, pledge, with the targets, yes, but the, with the action, no. So I think there's lots of reasons not to be proud. And even though I am very proud of lots of um, what we are doing in my city and our climate targets and renewable energy production, then uh, it has we would have we, we needed to do something before already and something. It's maybe not in the energy sector, but uh, we have lots of difficulties to mitigate the uh, emissions that uh, derive from from transportation, and this is something that is very difficult to 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 gain uh, re real changes in in transforming transportation sustainable and maybe one thing I would like to mention is the consumption that uh, is in it, it, it's really in an unsustainable level and I really think uh, personally that when we set our climate targets we should also consider much more the, the, the footprint that is caused by our consumption in our cities in the global north. So this is something that I think we don't take seriously enough at the moment because consumption is, it's, it's, a, it's origin to lots of emissions and this is something that we need to also, also to take a look at. So it's not only the energy consumption and energy production, but so many other things as well. So uh, maybe this is something that 
I'm not that proud of yet, but uh, I want to say something positive after that. So I think we have lots of lots of people that are more uh, understand these questions more all the time, and people are demanding more action. And when we talk about civil society and climate movements, in my opinion, we I we need uh, lots of different kinds of civil society and activism and all kinds of is very welcomed because we need to. We need to, we need more pushing and and more more of those messages that say to the decision makers and companies and and everyone that we support you to do more. So I think it's really important to say that you support uh, more climate action because that's the reason we are able to do more climate policies when the people support them. So I'm really proud of the civil society at this moment how much they are pushing pushing new uh, climate policy targets in cities and at national level, and I'm sure that in COP27 and, and rights of the civil society to to make their voices heard is very important topic in this COP as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. That's an indirect common, uh, compliment, and, uh, compliment to you, Willy. Civil society is something to be proud of, uh, and I think it's, it's true. Um, Money, did you want to respond to that, or <laughs> you're like, hey, you always want to respond to to to, to compliment or not? You know? It's because Nina's on Zoom, so I'm the woman. Uh, here. <laughs> uh, listen, I think I'm not proud of myself. In all honesty, um, I find that this conference has made me a little deflated, a little more cynical than I already am. Oh, uh, yeah, which is hard. That's not good. That's hard. Yeah. How come? Uh, yeah, and a bit pessimistic, and I don't know why. I think the conference just makes it feel really big. I, I think it makes it feel everything very, or at least a lot of the like, you know, what you see in the negotiation. It feels so. Um, I used to work at the Ministry of Justice, and one of the reasons I left is because it was very lawyery. It was very, where is this comma gonna go, and should we say two or four? And I find a lot of the discussions for anyone who's been in there is, is that's what it's like, and that's what it's always like to work here. So, um, or to work with large international organizations. So sometimes I find that's deflating. So I'm a little bit not proud of myself because I find myself a little bit pessimistic. However, yesterday I was walking around on the, in the outside of the blue zone and there were just, um, now I'm gonna declare that I'm old, but there were a lot of young people. Right? <laughs> no, a lot of young people sitting together and talking and kind of, you know, what looked like making things happen on the ground and that I found on the one I know you wanted what I'm not proud of but I told you that but I found that was on the other hand you know inspiring to the other direction right so I'm not proud because of a my cynicism b because even I doubt this mechanism and I think it's a very important mechanism that exists but on the other side I'm still happy that I'm here and I think it's an important place to play the game whatever it is and to lead to results and even if that's just three people sitting outside or presenting a variety of civil society ideas of how to make a change locally that can then be copied globally or locally in other places. Okay. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, but just, just to, to make sure that we are not have only two ladies speaking. Uh, Andreas, what are you not proud of? Yeah, that, that's a quite a few things. So, oh, great. Uh, first I love first it. is uh, <laughs> the agreement with, uh, uh, with the climate activists about this uh, um, getting out of greenhouse gas emission in 2035. So instead of 2030, I, I forgot to mention that it was now five years later, but we fixed it. Um, Cologne declared climate emergency two years ago. This is what ago. you're proud of. Yes, I mean. But, yeah. but we, yes, we want to know what you're not proud of. Why? You know, this yeah, is yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can tell you also why. Be, because why? now the administration is, it is possible to make other proposals also to things that might be more expensive than, uh, so, so that, that's the reason of climate emergency. That, that is a, uh, for it's, it's good for the administration it, to, to look more at, at climate issues in their decision and their proposals to make for the city council. That's it, and I, I think it was a very, very important step. Um, at least I'm also very proud that we, um, our lignite coal power plant, we go out and we replace it uh, a little bit like in our sister city, Turku. I saw your savage uh, um, uh, water plant and so in, in the rockets under, under, under Turku. It was a very interesting thing. We, um, we make now um, 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 a savage sludge power plant okay. together with the city of Bonn and also with other 
uh, um, sustainable and fossil-free solutions. Now we can replace this this uh, lignite coal power plant. I think that's also a very very big step. And uh, the third. But thing is that I something you're proud of? Is that G that Germany, as uh, m one of the most developed economies in the world, is still burning brown coal? Yes, you, you know, we. I said we are based on brown coal, so that the coal is like in, for example, in Poland, it's also very, very difficult to, to, to get out of this, uh, this industry because also a lot of people are working there. That's so, and in our city was a headquarter, and so to to to, de to explain to people, twenty five thousand people now your job is lost in the next years. That's not an easy. Easy way. So we have uh, also federal system to, to negotiate also with the, uh, with the federal level, with the state level, how we can challenge this. Uh, uh, no, how we, we can manage this, this challenge. And that's that's. I, I think it, it was uh, it, it was hard work in the last year, but at least we have a majority. We convince a big majority in, in our population, and that's also very very that's important. Right. You know that that you. Yeah, uh, we are not. We are not China. We we no. cannot. So so we, uh, especially in Cologne, we, no. we have to deal with with our citizens and of course. Uh, with, without having a majority with the citizenship, it yeah. doesn't work. And this is that. Of course, this is something we're going to touch up right now because like, how do you get these people along and how do you transition justly? But I want to hear one thing you're not proud of. You're I'm not gonna. You're, you're not gonna get off the hook. Pardon? One thing you're not proud of. Maybe you understood me not correctly. At least, I think we we started too late. Okay. So we started this pro process in 2014, and it's too late. Like, given other example, by the as a, a, a cycle politics. So, go to to Copenhagen, and they worked for cycling politics since 30, 40 years. We yeah. started now maximum 10 years ago. Now we, we are on the way. For example, in the city center, we have 60% of the streets where 150,000 people are, in, are cycling lanes, so we have priority for the cycles. But we have to, be, to get quicker and quicker, and, and the problem is perhaps we don't have the time. So yeah. time is running, very, very, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's the thing I'm not very proud of. We have the time is too short now, and we didn't act early enough. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, would you want to want to add something you're not proud of? Sure, I, I would. Um, I would say <laughs> that we we all saw globally uh, when the pandemic hit how quickly governments acted and how much money was devoted to addressing the impacts of the pandemic and. My friend and colleague, the health minister in British Columbia, in one of the early briefings he gave to cabinet, just at, at the end he said, and then there's climate change for which there will be no vaccine. And we have failed to convince people that we need to act with the kind of urgency on climate that we have toward the pandemic, when it's every bit as uh, potentially harmful and lethal, per likely more yeah i think that's uh i think a very nice an analogy like how how come are we able to act so quickly and so vividly on on a on a global pandemic but not on something that's been going on for such a longer i think that's a, a, a very very nice thing to add thank you for that um and i think this also comes down to kind of and and you touched already a bit on it andreas is like how do you get people along right how do you get the citizens involved because this is one of the most, the biggest challenges, right? Like, how do you get people to comprehend something like climate change? And how do you get them to maybe given a bit of their welfare they have gained, you know? Like, especially when you're looking at energy intensive com uh, countries like, you know, European countries or, 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 or North American countries, maybe Israel as well, actually. Um, so, how, like, how do, you, how do you get everyone on board? And especially, we're, we're doing this for everybody. How do, you, how do you make sure that nobody's left behind? Um, Lee, maybe I would like to, to give the floor to you. To like, how, 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 how are you doing that? Uh, 
Um, well, I think something that's come up here already a number of times is a getting people involved, right? So people in civil society and organizations involved to 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 have people understand and to have people know, right? I think also there's a um, we'll call it a branding issue, right? So with the with the climate crisis, and that's there's a lot of opportunity in climate, as we all know and we've all seen with green jobs, despite the issues, and we'll touch on it a little bit after that address mentioned. And I think what you need to do is to find ways to make those opportunity worthwhile for a variety of populations, right? So Israel, for example, has a very big land use issue. We're a very, very small country with a lot of ecologically valuable land and very little solar power as of till now because of a variety of reasons. But one of them is that we have very little land. So we've understood that we need to use a lot of dual use land, whether it's on top of buildings or other sources of dual use to have a lot of renewable energies. And that's quite a difficult thing, right? Because we're talking about not individual houses, we're talking about buildings. So we need A, money, and B, initiatives. So one of the, for example, initiatives that came up from our process that we ran through is to have the government move that kind of stuff forward, first of all, in public housing, right? So public housing is easier because there's more government involvement, there's more theoretical government money, and more interest in doing it. Because not as it a relevant tool in mitigation, it's also a relevant tool for adaptation and just transition, right? Because we're talking about populations who are less able to pay or in a more difficult socioeconomic positions, taking these older buildings and retrofitting them, and I think you mentioned that as well, the idea of retrofitting, which is very difficult, but once the government has an incentive to do it, A, because of its climate change commitments, and B, because of the long-term savings it'll have for those specific populations, and then expanding those projects onto other residencies is a big way to make that forward, right? Like once you see that's happening in certain populations, in mixed buildings, there's a way for people to see the advantages of solar panels on the roof, despite the sometimes initial costs. Um, another project we've moved forward, for example, is using uh, solar panels as an economic incentive in the Bedouin population in the Negev. So we're talking about a, a very socioeconomically challenged group with a lot of discrimination against it, and we see the use of solar panels in these communities as a great way to leverage the, I hate using that word, but leverage the climate crisis, right? To have these populations who are not necessarily involved in the discourse regarding climate, but to have them contribute significantly to mitigation, and that's by having economic incentives to move forward. To have solar panel, which will, A, are healthier than, for example, generators that I mentioned before that are also used in these populations, B, have income for these, this population as well, and C, serve as another way for the Israeli government to install solar panels in places that it wouldn't have necessarily been able to without collaborating with these populations. And I think A, collaboration, and B, solidarity is the way to move things forward, if we're going back to your question at the beginning. Okay, great. And, and just out of my interest, is, like we, we see that there's these extreme subsidized uh, uh, schemes in, in Germany, for example, when we're looking at solar power, solar power generation, PV generation. Germany is not as sunny as Israel, uh, but I think... They're, 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 they developed the, the, the most amount of PV, or the, the fastest, I think, uh, in, in the past decade. Uh, thrown stuff, shitloads of money around, uh, on it. I think in, in Israel, you don't need those, those many subsidies because you have sun 300 days year round. Uh, I do you have solar panels on your roof? Solar I don't, don't want to burst your bubble, Max, uh. but... Uh, uh, Israel has less than 10% solar energy at the moment, which yeah. is very unfortunate considering we have about 330 days of sun. Uh, do I have solar panels on my roof? No, because I live in a shared building um, which did not have solar. Well, we have solar panels to heat the water, but we don't have solar panels to create electricity. It's interesting because Germany is referred to a lot in the discourse regarding solar power and, oh no, Germany subsidized and now look how expensive electricity is. Mm -hmm. So Israel subsidized very little solar panels at the beginning and stopped many years ago because it said it's reached grid parity, as in it's financially viable and relevant to do it anyways. And um, a big proponent of free market economics, and it'll happen by itself, but it's not happening by itself. No. Uh, we keep adjusting our targets to better targets, but we're not reaching even the original targets. So 10% renewables in 2020 we didn't reach. And, and what is your role in civil society? Like, do you, uh, will you, or how do you get people along? Because if, if the market needs to sell, solve it, uh, will you have a campaign promoting solar panels on roofs, for example? Is that something you're working on? Uh, not something I'm specifically working on. I know it's something that other civil society organizations have worked on in the past, but it's not necessarily enough, right? Uh, incentivizing individuals financially 
and or it's the big bad word in the room, which is regulation, right? If you want, um, Israel, for example, has a s solar water heating on every rooftop, right? Because by law, you have to. So when things are enacted in law and nobody likes it, it's, un it's unpopular globally, the idea of regulation. But realistically, to get a market jump started, it's the way to get a market jump started, in my opinion. And, and I think a campaign in that direction will be quite difficult now in Israel, but it's worth trying in any case. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lee. Um, Minister Heyman, like, how, how is that going? Is everybody, how, how, how do you look at marginalized, marginalized group in, 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 in Canada? Like Canada is obviously also one of the few nor, like, uh, north, uh, countries of the global north also dealing with ind indigenous people. Is that something you are, you're taking into account when you're looking at this transition? Couple, a couple of things with uh, with indigenous people. One of the things we did early in our we've been in government for five and a half years. One of the things we did early was to bring in legislation that placed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People at the the heart of lawmaking. So we, when we built our climate plan, we built it uh, with fairly deep consultation with uh, both indigenous nations and large scale or broad scale indigenous political organizations. They have said, and I take no issue with it, that we didn't consult well enough, so we're continuing to work on that and, uh, as we go forward. Uh, but we also uh, have um, invested heavily in helping indigenous communities, particularly in the north, get off diesel power and onto renewable power. Uh, we have a number of programs that, uh, that support indigenous communities on an equal basis with local governments. Uh, uh, with climate action funding, whether it's a joint federal provincial program that we have called the Clean BC Communities Funds or a local government climate action program, which is purely provincial. Uh, outside of uh, the issue of indigenous people, we, we've learned from our early system of rebates for, uh, that we were giving for zero emission vehicles as well as uh, um, zero emission uh, home and water heating systems that we were effectively giving money to people who didn't need it. Okay. And what we needed to do was to take the money we had and target it more effectively at the people who did need it by income testing it. And but how did you do that? By? Well, we, we've just, we're changing the program. Uh, we're in the process of changing the program to, <clears throat> uh, to um, make the grants not universally available, but make them available on an income tested basis. We're also extended uh, our program from new vehicles to used electric vehicles, which are more affordable, and we're also taking taxes off such things as, uh, as electric vehicles, but also uh, electric bicycles. But isn't that also very pressuring, like the capacity of, of, of governments to kind of, like, because that's one of the reasons you, you tend to hear is that having these extremely focused programs, it, 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 they, it, it's, it needs, it, you will ask so much of regional or local governments that they tend to kind of uh, bypass it. Is that something you, you were experiencing? Do you understand my, my question correctly? No, I'm not sure I do. Are you so talking like, about the local government programs or the individual No, no programs? just like the, the, the pro normally, like you, you were saying that you were rebating a lot of people who, yeah. who didn't actually use the energy because you were unable to really focus no, down on the people no, no. who really needed it. Yeah, what I meant was if you give somebody like me a rebate, uh, to help me buy an electric vehicle, it's unnecessary because I'm going to do it anyway and I can afford to do it. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, is focus uh, the assistance and the, uh, the rebates to the people who really can't afford to do it without assistance. I'm not sure I was clear. Yeah, exactly. And my question to you is, is, doesn't, is that a lot of effort for a, com a go government to put that into place, such a scheme? I don't think so, no. Okay. No, that's great. So that's good to hear. I think it makes it's, you just have to design the program well. What, what my experience has been in the last three or four years actually is that we have theoretically good programs to transition, say, for instance, home energy retrofits or, or zero emission or close to zero emission uh, uh, home and uh, space and water heating. Uh, but we weren't getting the take-up we were expecting. And the reason we weren't getting the take-up is because they simply weren't well-designed programs, either in terms of people understanding 
how to access them. It was incredibly complicated. A friend of mine who uh, specializes in this and is very well educated uh, called me up to say, look, I know what I'm doing and I can't find out how to access these programs. So how is somebody else supposed to do it? So we, it caused us to take another look at it. Like, why aren't we making it simpler? And why aren't we also ensuring that the people who need the assistance, both to make the transition for climate reasons and also to make their life more affordable by lowering their energy costs, we're not actually making sure that they can uh, get the assistance they need to make that transition. Okay. So if we can't do that, there's no point having a program. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So. Um I will try to kind of um, finalize there. So I would like to, uh, Nina, would you have, have last comments on this, this kind of transition um, uh, and, and, and making sure that all these, these, these that nobody's left behind? How's that, how, how are you doing that in Finland? Well, uh, first of all, I want to start by telling my favorite policy, uh, policy that, that we have. I think we all of us have some kind of favorite policy or favorite report when it comes to combating climate change. And recently we were updating the energy and climate change strategy in Finland and there was conducted a gender analysis of the climate policies that we were going to take. And I think it's very, very important And when we are planning the policies, we have knowledge, information and facts how they are going to to, to alter the lives of different people and different groups. And when making policies, we have to, besides this plan also, how we are taking uh, different kinds of people uh, along us to, to implement those policies and how will they be received. And there was very in interesting results found out on how we are targeting, for example, communications on the climate policies, if we are even taking account of all different people and, and their needs. and. This is something that we can do more when we are really take this account in the, in the very beginning of, of planning the policies. But I really think that, uh, well, all of us people and human beings, we really want to be meaningful and living in meaningful times. And this is a meaningful time to be alive because we are the last generations who can really combat climate crisis so that uh, we, can, we can really try to put the global warming under 1.5 degrees and I really believe that people want to be uh, doing this together and, and and have the motivation and have, have the actions to really be involved and this is, this is something that especially local leaders can do with them because we are the most closest to people so this is something that we can uh, do it together to really give the means to people who want to participate because it's not always so that those who want to participate they have the means to participate. I think that I saw a study recently that, that had studied how young people see themselves as part of climate action and uh, what struck to me the most was that they felt that they are being more objects of climate policy discussion than real partners of, of decision makers and maybe this is something that we need to consider more in future. How would we take different groups of people uh, in partnership in creating climate policies and not just take account the people who we are planning them to. This is something that probably will uh, result in more sustainable um, policies that people accept better. And the last point I want to make, I think most important maybe in all of this is social security and welfare state. Because when we have climate policies that affect negatively to someone's work, someone's energy bill, or or whether when climate crisis is on the point that will affect negatively people's lives on a daily basis. It already does so, but when it will become more clear, we really need our social security system to aid people uh, in this, because it's not only the climate policies that need to answer the, to climate crisis. I think it's it's all policy areas. Thank you, Nina. And I think that I, I totally agree with you. And, I, and especially also being here, I think there's no, no, um, uh, we're, we can't fight uh, climate change uh, and not forget about human rights. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that is, especially also during this COP, something to, uh, to, to keep in our minds. 
Um, I think I want to uh, close off uh, the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, but uh, before I, I'll do that, I'll give uh, the, I would like to give uh, a person to, uh, to ask a question to the panel. If, if, if somebody would like to, then I'll, I'll give the microphone. Uh, I'll come and I'll, I'll provide you with the microphone myself. Does anybody want a question? Is everybody, everybody's ready to go out. All right, so then I really want to thank everybody here on the panel. Lee, Minister Heyman, Andreas, and uh, Nini, thank you so much. Uh, it was an honor to host you and uh, have a great uh, continuation of the COP. Thanks, Max. All right, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great guys. Well yeah. Done. yeah was, there were like 20 people. Hey, there were, over, there were four times the panel. So was, I actually enjoyed the conversation a lot. So, uh, so thank you for that. And it's, oh, it's, oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, really? Nice thing is, is the, 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 the planning was also recorded. Uh, it will be also, uh, I will I'll send it afterwards to, uh, to if, if, if uh, interesting. A group picture, yeah, yeah, let's do a group picture. The most stylish that's panel I've seen. Do you know that? Yeah, we are very stylish, very stylish. Yeah, but maybe with the, 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 the cop in the, in the background would be nice. Is that okay, uh, Soka? Yeah. Right. Yeah.